Hi everyone, how's it going? My name is Ian Isaacs. I'm the head of global growth for the Founder Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. Uh, we have an amazing, I'm super, super excited for today's webinar. I say that for like nearly every one of them, but I'm genuinely excited for this one because we've not really covered this topic and I think it's very, very important. We've covered it in tip, uh, uh, bits and pieces. Uh, but, you know, we have a great speaker uh, lined up for you today who's going to come and talk to you about everything you need to know about a cap table for your startup, how to build it, how to model it. And he's going to go very, very deep. We have about 30 to 40 minutes of content. So I'm super, super excited uh, for today. Uh, I'll, I'll let Jason uh, self-introduce himself when we bring him on shortly. Um, we had about 335, 350 people from my last count sign up for this uh, event today. We're at about 75 people live. I'm expecting we'll get to the 150 mark uh, or so. With that being said, uh, let me just go over some housekeeping uh, items so everybody knows where everything is. First off, as everyone can see on the right-hand side, you can, there's a chat. Uh, obviously, if you're on your laptop or iPad, um, please use the chat to communicate with us uh, and just kind of let us know uh, what's going on. So for now, throw, us in, throw in the chat where you're coming in from. I see a lot of different people uh, coming in. Let me read this. It's Cape Town, South Africa, uh, Abuja, Nigeria, another Nigeria, Cairo, Egypt, Bulgaria, Brazil, Princeton, New Jersey, Cyprus, Pakistan. I'm here based in Dubai, UAE, uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, another South Africa. Uh, I think this is the UK. So we have a pretty uh, New York, San Francisco, uh, uh, so San Francisco Bay Area. So we have a pretty good global audience. Our speaker is actually calling in from Australia. I don't know where exactly, but I know it's 3 a.m. for him. So I'm very grateful that uh, he's taking the time to jump on in the middle of the night, um, which is uh, awesome. So anyway, we have the messages on the right. Uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, right underneath the messaging, there's a Q&A button. Click that. Please use that to submit us uh, submit questions to me. What's going to happen is uh, Jason's going to come on, do 40 minutes of content. After that, uh, we'll switch over to Q&A, and I'll be using the Q&A, um, let's say, uh, section to, to receive questions, bring it up on stage. We'll do about five, six of those, right? And the last but not least is you see a bunch of emoji icons at the bottom. Please use those to like just express uh, any, any, any of those particular emojis during the presentation. All right, with that being said, we're about three minutes in. We're 100 plus people live. Actually, if you want to bring up Jason, that'd be great. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to run a poll uh, just to get a good idea of who the audience is today. I would love to know, you know, what is the next round you're looking to raise? Are you looking to raise a friends and family round? Are you looking to do a pre-seed, seed, or series A? Um, so does that come? Awesome, Jason. We can hear and see you. Hi. How are you? Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Awesome, Jason. Wild. Can you see the poll uh, on, on stage? I can. Okay, awesome. So it seems it's a little bit early. We have about 35 people vote, that have voted. Uh, but it seems like majority of the people are doing pre-seed and we have uh, some people doing seed and series A. Yeah, so you have pre-seed and friends and family. I hope that information is helpful for you as you're doing your presentation. I'll let the poll run in the background and uh, so if whoever wants to vote, they can access it there. Awesome. Uh, Jason, we're ready for you. Uh, I guess for the audience, you want to tell them where you're calling in from because I know you said it's around three in the morning for you. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's, it is great to be here. Uh, found a lot. You'll all experience this with your global startups. <laughs> so occasionally you get a really early one, but it, it's cool. You know, I'm used to it. So yeah, I'm calling from uh, Queensland in Australia. Um, it's a beautiful place. We, we're very blessed. So yeah, look, happy to be here from Australia. I spent a lot of time in the US these days as well, but um, at the moment down down under, as they say. But thanks for joining. Uh, looking yeah, forward uh, to thanks. sharing. Yeah, thanks for being here. Oh, uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. Look, we do have quite a bit to cover. Like, um, yeah, your cap table is gonna... one of the most important. Sorry, man. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so I'm going to remove myself from stage. I'll let you take it away, and then uh, I'll, I'll hop back on. Um, doing the Q&A, all right? So it's, you can screen share whenever, but I'll let you self-introduce and then uh, I'll disappear now, all right? <laughs> okay, great. Cool, thanks. I'm gonna check my camera's okay. Um, cool, hi everyone. 
So yeah, we're going to cover cap tables for early stage companies. Uh, I've got a little presentation. I'll just share my screen. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it to somewhere between 30, 40 minutes. It is a quite a dense topic. So there's going to be quite a bit of information coming your way. It is being recorded. It'll be shared. We're going to run through an exercise together uh, at the end as well to help you sort of bed down and really um, understand the concepts in a very you know practical way. Um, and there's also going to be office hours uh, with me in a couple of weeks so that you can um, dig into this even further. So yeah, so my name is Jason Atkins. I'm the co-founder of uh, Cake. We're a global cap table software company. Um, we've got customers all around the world. And so, yeah, I've been helping founders with their equity for six or seven years now as co-founder of Cake. Um, we've got thousands of companies on there. We mentor with the, the best brands globally. So I really hope um, that this information is super helpful for you today. So what is you know, modeling. Today, we're going to talk about what it is, the common mistakes to avoid. We're going to give you some examples. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, modeling out capital raises. We're going to be talking about how to uh, model out your ESOP or your employee equity. And there's, you know, there's a really good exercise at the end. Uh, I'm going to give you a link that you can run that exercise yourself. Um, make sure that, you know, your cap table is modeled well for that next round at least one round. Okay, so let's just cover off the basics. I'm just going to set a little timer so I can keep on track. Talk all day on this stuff, but we want to keep moving. So your cap table um, is essentially a summary of who owns what in your company's equity. It's a very important for your ownership compliance. It will include all different types of equity, including stocks or shares or safes, notes, options, or warrants. Um, as I understand it, globally, these things, they might have slightly different names, but when it comes to you know, early stage equity globally, um, everything I say um, is, is the same, which is awesome. Uh, if there's differences I can think of, I'll, I'll highlight them, but you know, we've been you know, learning this globally now for some years and um, all this information should be relevant to you no matter where you are. Um, so there'll be, you know, your cap table is governed by, you know, an official document that comes from your country regulator in the US. It'd be called the Articles of Incorporation. Every time you want to use your cap table, you need to get uh, it approved by the stockholders, the shareholders, the owners of the company. Um, it's super important to keep it up to date. Don't mess it up um, because a bad cap table. Um, is a red flag for investors. So how is it used? Um, very simply, uh, it's used to help you comply with tax and regulatory requirements. It's used to help you raise funds and manage investments. So you need to provide it to investors before and after uh, any sort of investment round so that they know that they own exactly what you know, you've agreed and to see the impact of funding decisions. So what happens if you add uh, new investors or buy uh, shares or a safe round or employee equity, what happens to the overall ownership? So it's to understand the impact of different types of funding. So, you know, how or why or when are we, are we using it? So firstly, you know, to quantify potential dilution of ownership across funding rounds. I'm going to talk a little bit more about dilution as we go through. Um, to assess um, multiple funding offers with different terms. So you might have, um, you know, two different offers with different valuation caps or a different um, discount on a safe or, you know, a different pre-money valuation. So you can model out, look forward and see what the dilution is um, in different funding offers um, to understand the impacts of convertible debt securities. So that could be a convertible note or a safe. Um, 
with different valuation caps and different discounts, you have to be able to understand how much equity those instruments will amount to when they convert. Number four, so we're managing, monitoring employee option pool levels. Um, if you have employee equity, which is very common globally in startups, um, you might have 10% of your equity in that pool. But how do you know um, how much of that pool you've issued and how much is left and when it's going to run out and when you need to increase the size of that pool? So very important. And then finally, number five, um, would be potentially around an exit scenario. So just say you are later stage, Series A, Series B, um, what's going to happen when you sell the company and how much equity is each uh, investor or employee going to, to receive? How much cash will they get when you liquidate the company? So at a high level, what are our goals for our cap table? Why, uh, why do we do all this work? So... One of the most important goals, you know, this is Founder Institute and I'm a founder as well. You know, we have to maintain as much ownership as possible in our own companies. Of course, you have to do that in a fair way so that investors get what they need and, you know, the team get what they need. But you do want to maximize ownership for the founders and there's, you know, strategies that you can undertake to ensure that happens. So we have to make sure that investors trust the team. So the cap table has to be accurate and clear and easy to understand so that you can raise more capital and raise easier. And we have to make sure the team are empowered by equity as well. Um, a lot of startups will have, you know, 10 or 15, 20% of the company in the ownership of, of the team over time. And so it's super important that, you know, the company is getting value from from that, um, from that equity as well. So just digging into one of the cap table goals a little bit more. So founders want to own, you know, 50% or more of the company at Series A. Um, it's not easy. It does require efficient cap table management and efficient use of funds. Um, so just, just talk through a little example. So um, the best you know, the best way to raise capital, I suppose, and run your rounds would be to say the first round would be your seed round and the next round would be your Series A. Then you only have, you know, one round of dilution at seed and then you're running your Series A. But what often happens um, in a startup's life is that there's multiple early rounds and that is okay. It is, it is quite common, but it's important to understand how that's going to dilute you. So, for example... If you run pre-seed and seed, and then you have a second seed before you get to series A, each round can dilute you by 20%. Plus you have the ESOP dilution in the 10 to 20% range. So if you think that through, you're starting with 100% with the founders, then you add the ESOP, so you go down to 85%. Then you do your pre-seed, you go down to 70%. Your seed could take you down to 60, and your series A could take you down to 48. So in that example... Um, at Series A, the founders have, you know, 48%, so it's around the target. It's not too bad. But if you were able to go pre-seed, seed Series A or, you know, skip one of those rounds, you can see how you're going to um, have more equity. And, you know, that's an important strategy. So with regard to minimising dilution and retaining your equity, um, it's a important to be awesome with your funding and, and raise less rounds, as I said. <clears throat> How can we do that? So we've all heard of bootstrapping. Um, it's essentially just achieving as much as you can without raising a round. So it doesn't mean you have absolutely no funding at all. It could include you know, a little bit of your own capital or a little bit of friends and family. It um, definitely includes a lot of sweat equity, be that from yourself and or you know your team. So, you know, learning fast and hitting as many milestones as you can while bootstrapping uh, is really important. Even when you do have funding, so if you've managed to get a pre-seed round done, learn as fast as you can, hit as many milestones as you can, as quick as you can. Um, time is a real, really, really costly element when it comes to your cap table and, and dilution. So every month that you're burning funding that you've raised, you're essentially diluting your equity. Um, because you need to raise 
you know, capital sooner. So the faster you can learn, the faster you can hit milestones, the less dilution you're going to have. Um, yeah, being super strong with your terms and valuations. So um, some founders are exceptional at getting the highest possible valuation on their rounds. You don't want to be unfair to the point that it costs you down the track, um, you know, with future rounds. So you want to have a valuation that's, that's fair and reasonable so that you can have increasing valuations, you know, each time. But at the same time, you don't want to have your valuation too low that you're going to overly dilute as you go through the round. So, you know, just being aware of where the market is, you know, from a valuation perspective, making sure that you're pricing yourself as high within the reasonable range as possible um, and being really strong with that, explaining to investors that it's important that you don't overly dilute because you need to maintain your cap table, you know, in, in strong shape through the rounds. Um, you know, having an amazing team with no waste. So, you know, having the smallest possible team to have all the, you know, the needs that you have to be able to hit your, your growth and product goals um, is very important. So, for example, you know, having product and design and engineering sales and marketing skill, you know, as small as you can to move quickly um, is, is really important to, to not having to raise too much capital and get diluted. And the last one is not obvious because, you know, when you're going to market and you're learning your channels, um, there's quite often that founder led part that's very important, especially if you're innovating, but um, you want to get it as quickly as you can from founder led to really scalable channels um, because the scalable channels are much more fundable with seed and series A funding. So just quickly on, you know, I think we're going to finish the cap table section and get into modeling in a minute, but um, you know, what are the red flags? What are we trying to avoid? What are investors not like to see so they don't like to see large holdings with no value add so um for example the most likely way this would happen would be um a co-founder that has left so you might start off with 50 percent each and you know at the end of the first year somebody leaves and you've got this huge amount of equity with someone that that you know is really not adding any value so you have to have a vesting schedule founder vesting on founder equity so that if someone leaves, the, the founders that remain can get that equity back into the company very easily. Um, so that's really, really important. Uh, again, founder equity too low. So if the founders have been too diluted over time early on via deals with, say, friends and family or, or early angels, things like that, um, then investors aren't normally willing to invest because they want the founders to have enough equity to, to go through the really hard journey that needs to happen. Um, by not having the ESOP in place. So whenever I say ESOP, that you just think of that as employee equity in whatever country. So ESOP stands for employee share option plan or employee stock option plan or, you know, whatever country you're in, just understand that that's where we're talking about employee equity. So it's extremely common all around the world now to compete and get the right talent, um, you know, and engage and retain them. It's very important to have an ESOP. And investors don't want to see you raising money from them and then adding the ESOP because then it, they get diluted. So um, you want to have that in place. Of course, you want to have good data and good records. It shows that you have the capacity, you know, to do the things you need to do as a founder. You get a little bit of um, like room for error like early on and you can get some help from, from investors and advisors, but you want to get into really good shape with your cap table very early on, builds trust with investors. Look, bad terms and side deals, um, you know, with friends and family and your early angels do reduce the chance of getting seed and Series A funding from more professional investors. So you want to keep those terms as standard as possible. And there's documents like, you know, the Y Combinator safe um, and, you know, Cake has standardized safes and subscription agreements and things like that built in so that you don't have to take bad terms. Um yeah, and just having too many investors um, can create problems for your cap table as well. All right, so getting into actually modeling out your cap table. So that's kind of the core of why we're here. So, you know, a cap table model is essentially looking forward and seeing what's going to happen with your cap table over time. So if we currently have, you know, a few founders, what's going to happen when we raise pre-seed? How much dilution are the founders going to get? Or if we've already raised pre-seed and friends and family, what's going to happen when we raise our seed round? How much dilution is everybody going to have? So 
it can kind of be scary and confusing, especially, you know, a lot of founders and don't have finance or legal backgrounds. And it, it is kind of an uncomfortable thing to see your percentage going down over time. But the, the concept, the basic concept is just say for, you know, you're at the seed company and you're the this founder here and with the gray box with 30% of the company um, after seed. So you've got a $5 million company. If you look at the bottom, you know, they've raised 1 million on 4 million pre that's a 5 million post $5 million company. You've got 30%. So that's $1.5 million worth of equity. So that's great. But that's very illiquid. Uh, you couldn't really sell that. Now you fast forward to series C, that founder has come down to 12%. So they've been diluted from 30% to 12%. But at that point, if you have a look down the bottom again, there it's, they've raised a $20 million series C round on an 80 million pre so a hundred million post. So they've got 12%, which is $12 million. And at that point, that's quite liquid. So that founder, even though they've been diluted from 30% to 12%, they've gone from one and a half million dollars to $12 million in value and, you know, much more liquid value at series C. So very important to be aware of that. The types of modeling um, that you can do, and we're going to run through some of these today, um, you know, modeling out a new round, um, converting safes and notes, really important to understand how to convert your safes and notes, including the valuation cap and, and discount if you have it. Um, modeling out an employee option pools is another important type of modeling, and I'm going to you know go through that today. The last type is exit waterfall modeling. Um, this is a later stage modeling process. I won't be going through that today. It is an important um, you know modeling type, but as this is an early stage presentation, um, we won't be digging into that in detail today. But if you need help with that, please do let me know, and I can give you information. Okay, so. Um, well, that one we've already done. All right, cool. So let's go into some examples. So we're going to run through this in, in a bit of detail just to help you get the basics down pat. So this is modeling out one angel round. So at the top in the assumptions, uh, we've got the pre-money valuation. So that's the valuation of the company before the money comes in. And then we've got the number of shares, two and a half million shares, and the share price of $2.40. And then you can see there's $2 million in angel investment coming in. The post money valuation of, excuse the rounding, 8 million. And then if you go across the top there, you can see the founders own 100%, two and a half million shares. There's nothing with employees. And there's no investors at this point. And then on the right hand side at the top, you can see the new money coming in. Um, well, the angels coming on board. So now the angels have 833,000 shares and the founders have been diluted from from 100% to 75% and the angels own 25%. So that's the, the summary at the top. And then going down into the actual detail, you can see that John Smith has 1 million shares, Susan has, shares, has 500 shares. You can see the percentages before the round, 40, 40, 20. And then down the bottom, this is coming in, Tony, Steve, Bruce, Carol, and Wanda. Um, and you can see the amounts they've entered in the angel investment. You can see the amount of stock they're getting. You can see the percentage that they own in the common stock. And then you can see the... Um, so that's a very... Model an angel round. So this is a almost identical summary, except we're adding in the ESOP, we're adding an employee equity, and we're just having a look at what that does to the cap table. So the assumptions at the stop at the top stay the same, but the summary of the cap table at the top in the middle has employee equity, 384,000, that's 13.3%. And then if you go across um, after the angel round, you see the founders have got 65%, the employees have got 10 and the angels have got 25. So the only difference between the, what the one I just explained and this one is that we've added the employee equity and it's diluted the founders. So that means that the ESOP or the employee equity went into the cap table 
before the angel round, which is the, the, the order that you're supposed to do it in. Coming down to the detail below, you'll see the founders are still there, John and Susan and David, and then we've got some common options um, with the team. So Rick and Carl and Phil and Frank have some, some options. And then we add the angel round in down the bottom. And then on the right-hand side down the bottom, you can see the overall fully diluted equity in the company. So let's go on to the next level of complexity uh, when modeling out a round. So at the top, the assumptions, look, there's different numbers in this, but we're really just here to look at the process and try and understand how adding in new investors um, changes the ownership and dilution and how you can sort of mathematically do that in a model. I'm going to give you a modeling template um, shortly and we're going to do an exercise together. So this is just talking through the process Then we're going to do an exercise together and then we can, we can sort of ask questions at the end. So in this case, the assumptions, we've got a pre-money valuation of 18 million because we're raising a, a later round. Um, you can see again, you've got the number of shares prior to the seed round, the share price, the seed investment of 5 million, post money valuation of 23 million. Um, going across, you've got the original cap table summary with the founders and employees. And then go across further, you've got the angel round coming through with adding in a 25%. And then going across to the right hand side at the top, you'll see there's now further dilution with the seed investment. Um, the seed investors coming in have 1,068,000 shares, which is 21.7%. And you can see the percentage ownership of the founders, employees, um, and angels have come down. Going down into the detail below, you'll see that the founder cap table has remained the same as the last page. Um, it doesn't move. Or not, it's not the same as the last page, is it? Because it's different numbers. But, um, you know, you've got your founders and your employees there. One second, I'm going to just fully mute myself. Can I mute myself? I just need to sneeze a little bit. I'll try and not do it. <laughs> Break your ears. Um, so, yeah. So we've got the, the founders and employees on the left. And then we've got the angel investment coming through in the, the next section. And then we've got the seed round coming through in the next section. You can see the money coming in and the overall dilution. All right. The final example that we have is uh, a Series A example. And you can see how these are just building on each other. And you want to keep your cap table in this way. If you're using a solution like Cake, Cake will manage all this for you. Um, we obviously do recommend using a solution like Cake to manage your cap table. It is a lot, lot better than using a spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet is a great tool as well. And I'm going to obviously explain most things via spreadsheet for you today because I want this to be as inclusive as possible. So, um, you know, this is to explain the process of cap table modeling, but this can be done better inside a solution, uh, you know, like Cake. Uh, there's others out there, of course. Um, but just going through this process, um, just one more time to help understand how this builds on itself. So at the top, you've got assumptions. So this is a Series A round, um, pre-money valuation, 60 million now. The number of shares is there. The share price is there. There's six and a half million coming in. And then you've got a post-money valuation, um, 66.5 million. And now you can see similar to the prior examples, You've got the original founding cap table, then you've got the angel investment coming in on the next summary, then you've got the seed investment coming in on the next summary, and now you've got your Series A investment coming in, and you have your overall um, summary. And then we've got an additional section at the top here where you start to analyze voting stock. Um, you, you know, the further you get along, you might have preference terms. And you might start to have a difference between ordinary and preference terms and you could have different voting rights. If that is the case, it's nice to start to track what voting rights different investors have. Going down into the bottom section, just to cover the detail quickly, you can see, you know, you've got a summary of your founders and your original employees. You've got your angel investment coming in. Then you've got your seed investment coming in. And then you've got your Series A investment coming in. One thing I would add that isn't in this summary is, you know, during this time, um, you would normally allocate an ESOP as well. I haven't got it in this example, but you can see on the top right, you've, you've currently got an unissued ESOP. You would be normally allocating 
um, more equity to your team throughout this. But this example is, you know, designed to help you understand how the round modeling occurs. Great. All right. So moving on to managing your options. Um, employee equity is normally done by our options, but you know, if you're using shares to do your employee equity, just that's you know, that's fine. All this stuff is still relevant, but you know, the preferred method is normally options. Some countries, you know, issuing employee equity is really difficult. So you would be using like a shadow scheme potentially um, that's not actually equity, but acts the same way. But um, look, you know, largely globally options is the, the normal way to do it. So um, as I said before, you would normally put the employee equity, the option pool in place before you run around, or if you need to increase the size of the pool, you would normally do that before you run around. You want to try and make sure it's big enough to handle all the people that you need to hire in the next 18 months. Um, you need to, you know, have an understanding of how much equity is going to be in your remuneration policy. Um, you need to understand market expectations for options. So how many options should team members be getting in the country that you're operating in or the countries that you're operating in? You know, what do advisors expect? Um, are you going to do any sweat equity for early engineers or marketing people or whatever? Um, and you want to really create a budget for that so that you can understand how long it's going to last. I have an example, you know, to show you and an exercise, um, you know, just coming up shortly. But, you know, very simply, this is what a model could look like. So, you you know, you've got your planned team, the type of, you know, are they an employee or a contractor or an advisor? What's the annual cost of their salary? And then, you know, how much equity are they going to get on top of their salary? And then you can calculate how many, you know, what the dollar amount is of their options and then their total package. We think that the best way to articulate to your team what they're going to earn. So their cash plus their equity equals their total package. And um, then you can calculate how many options they should receive based on that dollar amount. And then you can calculate um, what percentage equity they own of the company. And this little section down the bottom here is how you calculate how many options. So you've got the last round details of the company valuation, uh, how many shares are on issue, how many options are on issue, what's the share price. And then you can calculate how many options that is. I'm gonna go through that in a minute. Also how much equity to give. Um, it's a key consideration in different countries all around the world. Uh, probably not so much country to country, I would say, but in different regions around the world. So, you know, Europe and, and you know, Southeast Asia, US, you know, whatever, wherever you are, there are benchmarks and there's better and better data coming out. Um, in APAC, you know, CAKE has awesome benchmarking data. So if you're hiring, for example, an engineer, a senior engineer into a Series A company, you know, we can give you benchmarks on how much equity they should get. And all around the world, um, I think this is becoming, you know, really readily available. So, you know, this is important for you as founders. You don't want to give away too much equity, but you want to make sure it's fair and competitive so that you can attract the best talent. So do look for, for benchmarking um, tools to help you understand how much equity you need to give. Okay, so before I go into um, the next section, I'm just going to talk about modeling office hours. So as I said earlier, the goals of your cap table and management and modeling are very, very important. You want to maximize your equity. You know, modeling this out correctly could be the difference between you owning, you know, 10% more of your own company or not. So it's an extremely important skill. It's totally a learnable skill. You don't have to be too scared. Like you absolutely can learn it and you do need to learn it. Um, but you need to be fair about it as well. So you need to understand what's a fair valuation for your round, what's a fair amount of equity you know, to give to your team. So you're trying to balance that, that fairness to make sure that each stakeholder on the cap table has the right amount of equity. You want to look great to your investors when you're raising, you know, having a, a strong cap table and a clear cap table model is, you know, really important to help investors build trust with you. And it's important also to build an awesome ownership culture to attract, engage, and retain the best possible team that you can. So with office hours, that's going to be a, a teardown with me uh, in a couple of weeks. We're going to, I'm going to give you an exercise in a minute. We're going to go through it together, and you're going to take it away and build it for your own company. Um, super valuable process for you to go through. Um, it's going to help you get it right. 
Uh, we're going to answer all your questions. And it's going to be in about a couple of weeks' time. And the Founder Institute team are going to share some more information about that with you, um, definitely. But I just wanted to run that, run through that with you as well. All right. So now we're going to go into our modeling exercise for today. There's been a lot of information. Hopefully, you've taken some notes. I'm sure you're going to get summaries on the deck and recording and everything to help you learn. Um, but a great way to learn is actually get your hands dirty. So we're going to get you a spreadsheet in a minute and get you to have a play with it. Uh, we want you to build it for your company at the stage you're at. So um, level one of the exercise is going to be to model out one price round and convert your safes and notes. So if you're already doing pre-seed and you've got some safes, we want you to at least you know, model out your seed round with a price round and convert your safes into that. Level two of the modeling exercise for those of you hopefully you can all do levels one two and three but if you at least only do level one then that's great you've learned something and and you've, you've planned ahead um level two of the modeling exercise is you know the same as level one plus modeling out your employee equity so your employee options and level three is going to be modeling forward two rounds which i always advocate is the best thing to do just to think through how it's all going to go how much equity everyone's going to have um, a couple of rounds into the future. So modeling forward two rounds, making sure you convert notes and safes plus your employee equity. Okay. So um, let's get into this example. Uh, I'm going to hopefully, if I shift this over here, can you still see that? So just let me know if I've um, just messed that up at all. Looks like you can still see that. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure I put as much on my screen as possible. All right. So actually, I better give you this now. Um, excuse me while I put this in the chat. It's going to look a bit funny. So I kind of want you to play with this while while I look while I explain it to you. So firstly, up the top here on the left, just. You know, obviously understand that you need to make a copy of this. This, this is a protected sheet because um, it's a template and this is all just dummy information. But you need to make a copy. So you just go up here, file, uh, make a copy, and then you can edit everything in the sheet. So as I said before, um, this is the exercise. The goals are to minimize the dilution, minimize errors. Um, you know, some modeling is better than none. So if at least do level one, please. Um, it's very important. Uh, please do join the upcoming office hours to get unblocked and make sure you have a great cap table. And if you find this hard, please don't give up. This is a very learnable skill. It's a very important founder skill. Um, so ask questions. So as I said, there's, there's explanation here of what you need to do for each level. So with level one, you need to enter your current cap table information into the cap table sheet. So you come over here to the cap table sheet. And if you're still very early, you know, you haven't run around yet, you put your information in in this foundation round. So pre-money, and if you don't have a pre-money evaluation, just estimate. If you need a valuation tool, um, I'm also going to give you this um, Founder Institute uh, partner page uh, here. Um, look, there's lots of ways to value, but there's some very, very simple ways as well. And in here, um, in this toolkit, you've got a very, very simple valuation um, calculator. So if you do need to do evaluation, you can do that there. But um, yeah, so you get your pre-money, the, the the size of the new round. Um, if it's just like a friends and family, like really basic early round, um, then you got your post money. Here you've got the total number of shares on issue, um, the size of the ESOP pool if you have it. So you need to enter these in, and then you need to enter in this section down here. So how much do the founders have? Um, what's the foundation investor? Is there any ESOP? So that's, that's sort of where you would fill it in if you're at that stage. Now, if you're a bit further along and you've already done a seed round, for example, you could start here. You could start here with the seed round and you could just fill this information in. Or ideally, you would go and you would build your foundation round, then you would build your pre-seed round, then you would build your seed round. So it's really nice to be able to build it up from the start. You don't have to do that if it's too complicated. If you're getting lost, um, you, if you've already done a seed round, you can just start from there and then you can model forward. So as you can see here, this allows you to do like the foundation round, pre-seed, seed and series A. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool tool. So at the top, you've got your summary information. 
And then down the bottom here, you've got your more details. So however many founders, you can add rows here if you need to. Um, and then with your investors, again, you can add rows in here um, to include all the investors that you need. And then the ESOP, uh, you add you know, into the bottom here. So going back to the exercise, what I need you to do is enter your information into your version of the cap table sheet. Obviously, name it with your, your company. Um, then... You know, ideally add information from the foundation round. Um, you can, as I said, you can start from wherever you're currently at. You need to model out your next price round. So if you're, for example, you've done a foundation round and your next round, your pre-seed is going to be a safe, you really do need to wrap, model out all the way out to your seed round and make sure it's a priced equity round. Um, because if you have safes and notes, as you can see here in rows 13, 14, 15, uh, sorry, 13, 14, you need to include the conversion valuation and the conversion discount. So this is a quite a complicated thing to do for non-financial people. Um, it's totally doable, but if you've got a, you know, a safe with a $5 million cap and a 10% discount, or you've got a safe with an $8 million cap and a 20% discount, that converts very differently into totally different amounts of equity and you need to be able to model that out. So um, make sure you model out your next price round. That's why it's priced there in, in bold. Um, so you need to make sure your no safes and or notes convert to shares or stocks. All right. Now, level two of the modeling exercise is... Uh, hey, level Jace, one. Uh, yep. Sorry. Uh, Jace, there seems to be an issue with the access to the sheet. If you could um, maybe change that. People can't seem okay. to view it at the moment. Okay, it says here, um, people with access. Okay, let me just try this again. So I'm gonna copy that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, I did actually make a special copy for this event. So yeah, apologies. I probably hadn't reshared that, so my bad. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. That'll, that'll help a lot. <laughs> cool. Okay, so now you have access. Um, can we just double check that before I move on? It's quite important. Someone just let me know if we have access, please. Great, works for us. All right, awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, so level two is modeling also your employee equity. How long I've got a couple of minutes. I'll try and keep this quick. Um, so with that, you want to do everything in level one, but you also want to go to this ESOP allocation page and build out how you're going to model out your option pool. So there's normally, you know, for argument's sake, 10%. So down the bottom here is where you start. So you put your last round valuation. And again, if you don't have one, you know, put um, the best valuation example that you can. So you might need to do a quick valuation. You do need evaluation to be able to put, manage out your option pool. Then you put your total amount of shares and, you know, shares here and your total options here. Um, I'm going to separate it out the options. So you put your total shares here, total options here, then you got your total of shares and options there, and then you have your share price. So you need to fill in this bottom section and then you start putting your team up here. So um, the role, the type, um, the remuneration, the amount of equity they get on top of their remuneration, and then that calculates out what the dollar amount is of their options. Um, then it calculates out their total package, and then the spreadsheet will calculate out how many options they should get based on the amount divided by the share price and the amount of equity they should get um, based on uh, the total amount of shares in the company. So this is a really quite simple way to model out your pool. So you can add more rows in here if you need to. You want to kind of model out how many people you need on your team, including advisors and sweat equity in about an 18 month period, just to make sure that your option pool doesn't run out. So over here in uh, G22 is the total number of options. In G21 is the total of options that you've planned out. And then in uh, G23, we'll tell you how many options you have left and how much of your pool you have left as a percentage is, is uh, H23. So really simple way to model that out. Um, you don't have to do it like based on remuneration if you want. You could sort of just do it based on the total number of options. You can just enter them in column G if you want to do it in a slightly more simple way. Um, but look, there's a really nice simple way. So that's, that's 
Um, that's level two. So level one is modeling out one round. So just say you're at foundation round, you're at least modeling out pre-seed. But if you're going to do a safe, you have to go all the way to seed because you need to model out a priced round. Uh, if, you're, if you've already done pre-seed, you really need to model out just seed to, you know, for level one. Level two is modeling out your ESOP as well. And level three is um, modeling out two rounds plus, you know, your employee equity. So that's ideal. So from pre-seed, say, through seed and, and out to your Series A, including all the ESOP. Um, so I think that's it from me. I think I'm also on time-ish. So hopefully um, that was really helpful. And, um, yeah, um, I think we're up to Q&A maybe now. So back to you guys. Hey, Jason, this was super, super awesome. Thank you so much for me to the viewers. I hope you can see you. Uh, very, very in-depth. I like the fact that you shared so much content around the actual cap table. Some people couldn't see some of this uh, stuff in, in the presentation, which is expected because it's a screenshot. I like that you sent out everything to everyone so they get, you know, you guys get full access to everything. Um, Let's kind of jump into the Q&A because there's a lot that's come in. So, folks, the best way to do this is I want to do five, six questions and then break out for networking. But uh, is it please go to the questions, upvote it, and then we'll kind of go from there. So uh, you talked a little bit about benchmarking. Uh, Guillaume uh, from uh, Cotiva Brazil is asking, what's a good benchmark to issue pools of shares to your very early employees? Best thing of five years seem okay. Guys should know these yeah. are going to be hard questions to answer because everything that says the lawyer answer would be it depends, but uh, to your best knowledge, so whatever you can, to your best experience, so would you mind answering this? <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, look, we're huge believers in streamlining, standardizing, benchmarking. Uh, this founder journey is so difficult. We don't want every little thing to be super complicated. Um, so, yeah, I think there are very clear benchmarks when it comes to vesting, um, and everyone globally is really taking their lead from the US. So the most common vesting schedule is four years uh, with a 12 month cliff. So what the cliff is for those of you that are newer to this is in the, in the first year, the employees won't earn anything until they get to the, you know, the end of that year, at the end of that year, they'll get that whole year's worth of equity in one go. And that kind of protects the company because they're not really getting equity or options until they've achieved that whole first year. Um, and then they get, you know, they get it then. So yeah, four years with a 12 month cliff is, is the standard. Some countries will have a little bit more towards three years with a 12 month cliff. You could go out to five years. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem, I don't think, but the standard um, is four years. Awesome. Thanks so much. That was super helpful. Uh, we also, we don't have vesting uh, benchmarks or so, but we do have benchmarks for, your raise if you go to fi.co slash benchmarks there's some data there for you all to check out uh, all right let's move on to the next one emily from centennial was asking what's the best way to determine your company's initial valuation i think you had a, a calculator that you shared earlier you just want to briefly go over that yeah um absolutely like i can't um share my screen right now but i think in this q a section maybe if you let me um if you jump that out of that question right. maybe i can yeah perfect all right i'll do it now so um we've built a bunch of tools for founders because you know like founder institute there's just so much to learn and um so this is the valuation template that we've built so there's four main methods that you can use the revenue multiplier is more sort of a series A plus. Uh, that's the one everybody hears about, you know, 10 times revenue, whatever. Um, that's very standard, but it's not as common sort of pre-seed and seed. Uh, the valuation by stage is the most common way probably, which is kind of just like, where are you? Um, are you at idea stage? Are you at MVP? Uh, do you have revenue? Is your revenue growing? I think it's most common to just you know, try and fit in one of these buckets and explain why you think you fit in that bucket and where you fit. Um, that's probably the, the simplest and the easiest way. One of the, you know, problems I see founders doing is spending a lot of time on their really detailed financial model very early when they really have very little data and 
they do this big model, they do a big valuation, they can even sometimes pay a lot of money for that. And investors don't really pay that much attention to it because it's too detailed and um, the company's so, so early. So I do highly advocate doing a very simple valuation, like, like valuation by stage. That's how investors are going to look at you anyway. The future valuation method is, um, is a method you can use. It's not one I really like to use early because, again, you have so little track record. You don't have a lot of real data. So, but you can you know, say, hey, what's my company going to be worth in three or five years' time? And then discount that back, um, including dilution, to get the current valuation. And then you know, very early around the accelerator stage, um, the Berkus method is a widely accepted valuation method. So you give yourself a score between one and 10 for each of those five factors. So the idea, the prototype, the management team, strategic relationships and initial traction. And then you multiply each of those scores out by 500,000 and it gives you a total valuation normally in the 1 million to two and a half million range. So that's a widely accepted valuation method as well. And we've actually got a, a spreadsheet version of this that you can use. Um, so you would come into here at the top here, you can do a weighted average of a couple of different methods if you want, um, or you could just do, you know, hundred percent by stage. And then, um, you come down here and you, you sort of fill in that section. So if you were going to do by stage, you might write in here why you think, you know, so like I'm live, um, I've got an MVP, I've got some early traction. I'm valuing myself at 4 million, for example. Um, or you could do the Berkus method here. Uh, whatever. So I've got a template for you. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is to uh, have a clear method that you've used and be able to have a good conversation with your investors. And just before you raise, um, just talk to your advisors and talk to some investors that you know, go through the methodology you use, and you'll be good, in a good situation to, to go out to market and actually ask for capital um, with that valuation. Someone's okay. asked where to get that. So I'll just double check. I'll just double check you've got that. So First of all, I'll give you the toolkit uh, and then you can click through to, uh, this is the toolkit here, and you can click through to the valuation page from there. That's got the Founder Institute discount on it as well. So you do get a discount as a Founder Institute partner. So if you want to use Kate, um, there's a discount code on there for you as well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we'll definitely share that. Uh, we'll share all the links in the, in the follow-up email as well, guys, also along with the recording. Uh, all right, let's do a couple more and then try to break out for some networking. Um, I like this question by Ella. Um, she's asking, if you don't have employees at the pre-seed, do you still recommend allocating unassigned employee options in the cap table and present it to the investor? I guess that's... this. Is kind yes, of absolutely. Yeah, great question. And yes, definitely. I think um, the investors, the main thing you want to avoid with investors is that they give you their money and then you add the ESOP afterwards and they immediately get diluted by that ESOP allocation. So very good question. Great thing to do. You don't have to um, issue equity to the team. You just have to have it in the model. So, you know, the process is um, you sign a resolution of the founders essentially at that point, uh, or if there's like a little bit of a friends and family money there. So the, the current, shareholders sign a resolution to say we're implementing 10% pool. Um, and then when you do your model, you've got the founders, you've got the 10%, and then you show that to investors. So they know that when they invest, um, the ESOP pools are already created, and then they're not going to get diluted. So yeah, perfect. Good question. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Nini from Brooklyn's asking, uh, what about the board of directors or advisors uh, that you give equity to? Um, where would they fit and do you just kind of put them at the top or should you kind of model that out from, early, I guess, earlier on? Or I would yeah. So you, you, you don't have to give equity. You don't have to give equity to your board of advisors, first of all, but it is a good idea to have um, your board um, with equity. Sometimes a board member will invest to get a board seat. That's probably the best way. Um, but with your advisory board, um, it's great to give them a little bit of equity it's great to be doing this with Founder Institute. I would always advocate their fast agreement for doing founder uh, for doing advisor uh, equity. Um, so if you haven't seen it before, just Google Founder Institute fast, and it's a wonderful agreement that you can get into with your advisors, and it helps you understand how much equity to give them. Um, so, for example, it has uh, yeah, great. Thanks for sharing the link. So you know if you're 
idea stage or if your growth stage and how much value that advisor is is bringing it's a really great way to help you understand how much equity to allocate to your advisory team and then then you would go to a you know you actually then have to grant them like the you have to sign that uh, granting letter as well which you know you can do you know via by manual way or via cake um to actually issue the options but um yeah so if they have them um, put them in the option planning template and then make sure that the, you know, the overall allocated and unallocated options is in, in the exercise as well. Awesome. I should just show you uh, how to do it in the template because you're going to be using the template. So in the template, you would go into, into this section. Um, in here. Uh, you're not, you're not sharing your screen right now. Oh, okay. My bad. Got it. So just come in here and add any advisors into this section. And then on your cap table, you want to have, you know, allocated and unallocated. So anything that's been granted would be an allocated. And then what hasn't been granted would still be an unallocated. So you've got the overall ESOP pool in your overall summary. Awesome. That's super, super helpful. Let's do one last question just to make sure that we uh, can Break up for networking. This one is by Rodrigo in Madrid, Spain. Uh, you talked a little bit about pre versus post money, but like, as you know, everyone in the audience here is pre seed. I guess at a high level, what do they need to know about pre versus post, and like, how can they prepare for that accordingly? Yeah. So um, first of all, pre money is essentially the value of the company before the round. So when you value your company, essentially you're valuing the pre-money and the post-money is the pre-money plus however much cash you get. So that's the first thing to understand. It's not super obvious the first time you do it. To me now, after all these rounds, it seems really obvious, but I remember back in the beginning, like what's pre-money, what's post-money, why is it different? You know, like, so the post-money is just the pre-money plus the cash. Um, so that's the absolute basics. Um so like once you know that if you're talking about valuation, whenever you're talking about your valuation, you must be clear, is this the pre-money or is this the post-money valuation? Be very, very clear with investors. Probably the biggest mistake you can make with that is that the investor thinks you're talking about um, post-money and you're talking about pre-money because it can be 20% different. Um, so, for example, with a safe or a convertible note, if you're issuing a convertible note you, or a safe, you must explain if it's a pre-money or post-money um, valuation on the valuation cap or the discount when it converts because that can have a 20% difference in the amount of equity that, that an investor is going to get. So we're just, be, just know what each term is and know when you're communicating which... Uh, valuation you're using. Um, I think globally the standard for safes is post money. So the wire combinator safe is post money. Our safe in in cake is post money. I think everybody should just use post money safes. We're going to have a lot less problem. Um, but just look for that in any document that you're reading around around and make sure that you understand what it is. And when you're communicating to investors, make sure you communicate very clearly because this can actually have a pretty big impact on the dilution um, that you can get. Awesome. Thanks. That was super, super helpful and insightful. Uh, here, let me just put you back. But yeah, Jason, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we're going to break uh, away right now. We'll do a bit of networking. Um, so those who can stick around, Jason, I know it's super late for you, so don't feel <laughs> obligated, but it would be great for you to do so. I'll join the tables as well to get some feedback from everyone. Um, but like, yeah, Jason, any final words for the audience here? You still have about 140 people live. I think at one point we hit 255. So, <laughs> so we're, we're at the tail end of this, but uh, yeah, any last word, piece of advice for the, uh, for the team? Yeah, just look, thanks for coming. This is a very important part of your founder journey. You know, most of you won't have finance or legal background. So do take the time to understand your cap table well. It is a critically important part of your journey. Like I can't overstate that. 
you got to use your equity when you raise. Um, you got to, you know, you want to look good to your investors. You want to make sure you don't dilute yourself too much, um, and you want to make sure your employees, you know, your team have, you know, equity and come on this great journey with you. And then when you exit your company down the track, everybody, you know, has a massive outcome. So take the time to learn this stuff. Very, you know, good on you for being here. And um, yeah, like you can hit me up. So yeah, jump on this uh, the office hours. So the Founder Institute team are gonna share a link um it is very complicated stuff i've tried to simplify it as much as i could but like do take the opportunity to come and ask questions and get this right um in a very short amount of time i can probably help you solve something that might take you a while to you know to work out so um lean on us as much as you can we're here to help perfect yeah everyone the chat it's pinned on the chat the link you'll get the link also after but Appreciate you all sticking around. Um, we'll wrap things up here. Uh, you know, we do these webinars pretty frequently. Make sure you check out our events page, fi.co slash events. I think we do two, three of these events a week. We're just really trying to uh, provide the best content and make sure that everyone's prepared for their founder journey. And obviously, when you're ready, you can go join up for one of our core programs as well. Um, all right, so let's wrap things up here. Jason, thank you for taking the time. Uh, hopefully we see you on the tables, but everyone else will see you on the networking tables. Feel free to stick around. All right. Thank you. Take care.